Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain made low as we prepare the way for the Lord. That's somewhat what we do in this journey of Lent. We're not preparing for the Lord's appearing, uh, but we are preparing to follow Jesus on the road that leads to the cross. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we make our way through our examination of this part of the Sermon on the Mount. We're in the sixth chapter of Matthew today, and we'll finish the sixth chapter. And then we only have one more chapter left in the Sermon on the Mount, and then it will be Palm Sunday and Easter. Uh, But today we are uh, beginning in verse 19 and reading to the end of chapter 6 of the Gospel of Matthew. This is what Jesus says. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've told you before, I'm not great with sermon titles. Um, They are almost always the last thing I do when putting together uh, the bulletin, what I give to Deb. And it is not something that I'm usually thinking, oh, that's a really great title. That will really catch their attention, inspire their imaginations And I don't know that this one did, but I was trying harder on this one. And this one, I think, has a lot of worth, depending on how you hear it. When somebody asks you this question, where does the emphasis fall? What do you hear? When you read, what are you worried about? Do you hear, what are you worried about? What are you worried about? Nothing's going to happen. Everything's going to be fine. What are you worried about? There's nothing to worry about. Why is it that you're worried? Which, if you're a worrier, is no comfort for somebody to tell you nothing to worry about. But maybe that's not what you heard. Maybe you looked at that and you heard, what are you worried about? you got nothing to worry about. Everything's fine. What's wrong with you that you're worried? Also not helpful for a worrier because we're already worried. Don't tell us what are you worried about. You have nothing to worry about. What's wrong with you that you're worried And what Jesus is really getting at is what most of you probably thought. What are you worried about? What is it that's worrying you? What is it that's troubling you? What is it that is concerning you? What is the burden uh, that you're carrying around? This season of Lent has is the opportunity, I think. Lent calls us, rather, to call all of our ways of valuing things, placing importance on things. It calls that into question. All the ways that we would normally think, okay, this is what's important and this is what's not, called into question by Lent, because Lent is a season not of celebration, though every Sunday is a resurrection day, but Lent is a time of remembering how costly it was for us to be saved, how costly it was and is for us to be made members of God's family, to be brought into the family of faith, but also to be given eternal life, because Lent is remembering Jesus' road to the cross. We don't stay there. We don't remain on Good Friday. We move on to Easter Sunday because we are people of the resurrection. We are supposed to be living this resurrection life now. But this season, this long season, longest regular season of the church year, everything, any, anything longer is just called ordinary time, which doesn't help. Lent, long season of preparation, not just so that you can really celebrate Easter 
but so you can remember what it took for Easter to come about. Similarly, in this sermon, Jesus is calling all of our normal ways of valuing things and of placing importance on things, our normal ways of operating into question. What is most important? That's part of the problem with this worry thing. Who is it we're placing our trust in? What is it we're trusting in? Uh, What is it that is driving us? And if we're worrying, it's usually the wrong things. What's most important? Well, this has a lot to do with money and getting it. Jesus talks about these treasures. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth here, which is what a lot of people spend a lot of time doing, intentionally trying to store up treasures on earth. And if you were to come to this place, uh, come to America in 2014 from a different time, different place, different culture, say you were an alien that showed up and you wanted to learn about Earth and you came to America, what do you think you would say was the most important thing to Americans in 2014? If it is not money, it absolutely has to do with what it is that you want, what it is is the highest goal, the thing you're shooting for. And it would not be surprising if you thought money was the thing. Getting money, or at least getting things that come with money, possessions and those sorts of things, are what commercial advertising is all about, by the way. They're not really selling you a lifestyle or a way of thinking that works for them, uh, but really it's to get you to buy stuff. And if you have stuff, it's to get you to buy more stuff. And then it's to get you to buy more after that because it will not satisfy. What's the supreme good? What are we really shooting for? 500 years ago, Calvin was thinking this through. What is this treasures in heaven versus treasures on earth? And he said, whatever is our highest goal, our 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 supreme good, whatever it is we're striving for in life can get us in big trouble if it's not the right thing. Calvin said that if honor and reputation is our highest thing, our supreme good, what we most want in this world, then unfortunately we will rarely get there. Where we will find ourselves instead is in a lifetime and lifestyle of ambition and the sort of ambition that is willing to destroy other people in order to get that honor, praise, adulation that we most want. If it's money, then we might become rich people, but we will very likely become covetous people because it seems that no matter how much money you have, it is hard not to want more. Unless you're the very wealthiest person on earth, then you look at somebody more wealthy and go, well, that's pretty nice too. I like what I've got, but wouldn't it be nice to have that as well? Some of us have very vivid imaginations for what it would be like if money were no object. And God has not seen fit yet to let me use that imagination for good. I could give you such good examples of what you could do if you had tons of money. And I would do good with it, I assure you. And then I would have some toys along the way. If instead of honor, instead of money, if pleasure, and that's really what you would probably learn nowadays, if you were to come as as an outside observer from another culture, time, place, or planetary system, you would probably think what these people are all about is pleasure. Pleasure, whatever it is that makes them feel good, whatever it is that they think they want, and it doesn't even have to really please them, but they will go after what they think will bring them pleasure. And Calvin says what you will end up with instead is indulgence. And when he said that 500 so years ago, that was a bad word. Now we think you should indulge yourself a little bit. St. Patrick's Day tomorrow, you ought to indulge yourself. Um, You know, well, I've been doing so well, and so now I can indulge myself. Or, like some of us, we're about to go to the doctor and we should not indulge ourselves, but it's just hopeless at this point, so we might as well. So, what is the supreme good, what we're shooting for? And that tells us a little bit about what's driving us, but also drives this idea about what it is we're worried about or ought to be worried about. Jesus gives us this very difficult concept. It's actually simple, but very hard to live out. Everybody says you need to provide for yourself here now. That's what it's all about. And Jesus says, why don't instead you provide for yourself way down the road? And this is a tough sales pitch. How is it that I'm supposed to tell young people uh, that instead of necessarily worrying about retirement and planning for the kids' future and all these things, that really they ought to look even farther down the road and be laying up treasures someplace they cannot see, they do not know when they will get there, and they do not know what it will mean to have treasures in heaven. Jesus is perfectly delighted for us to indulge our our imaginations here and think about what it would be like to have loads of treasure. He just wants us to have the right treasure in the right place at the right time, because what he says is all this stuff we're working for here is not going to last. Moth and rust destroy here on earth. Thieves break in and steal here on earth. And so wonder of wonders, God is giving us this place, inviting us to have a place of our own 
where we can lay up treasure and inviting us to enjoy riches that will never fade, never perish, never spoil, never destroy. Still a tough sales pitch because I can't see them. I don't know where they are. don't know how much they are. And what are they going to be worth when I get there? Which is a silly thing to worry about when it comes to heaven. Not so silly on earth. This may hit a little too close to home, but uh, one of the commentators that I read every week for this part of the Sermon on the Mount is from Africa. He's from Zambia. And he um, is teaching at a seminary in Zambia, graduate uh, school in Zambia now. But along the way, and long time ago when he began his career, he was encouraged to essentially set up a, a retirement, a pension system. They do it a little different in Zambia. So what he did is he was paying money into something, but he basically bought a policy that 30 years down the road would provide enough money for him that he could, maybe less than 30, but years down the road could provide enough money that he could buy a house for his retirement. So he buys into this thing and he knows that it will provide X amount of money at the end. And when he has that, that ought to be enough to buy a house and that will be his retirement. Okay, so here's the countercultural part of it. He's in Zambia. I can never keep in mind exactly the currency in Zambia, but I'm pretty sure that I'm not making this up when he said they were, I, uh, let's see if I can say it. I think they were Kachwa. It's K-A-C-H-W-A. Here's the thing. This pension endowment he had paid into was supposed to, at the end of its, its term, pay him about 45,000 Kachwa. And in 1986, that was enough to buy a house. This was going to be a great thing. And then the country goes through this unbelievable time of inflation. Five years later, well short of his goal, when he thinks he's going to be able to buy a house at the end, five years after he buys this policy, your everyday ordinary school teacher is making 110,000 kachwa a month. His policy is going to give him 45,000 kachwa all the way down the road, which is now worth a couple of days of work. No retirement home in his future. Worse than worthless, he said about this. Even with our great plans, even with our thinking things through, this is a place where things break down, deteriorate, rust, spoil, destroy, or can be stolen. And Jesus says, that's not the place to put your happiness. That's not the place to put your treasure. That's not the place that you need to be shooting for. Our happiness should be in heaven. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also But this brings us to a problem. What are we really about and whom are we really serving? Who's your master? Because Jesus says, really, in the end, you're only going to have one. And you can figure out relatively easily what your master is, where it is your time, your energy, your attention, your care, your enthusiasm. Where does that go? Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You're going to hate one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. And we would never put it in such black and white terms. What we are always tempted to do is say, well, of course, as a good Christian person, my goal in life is to serve God and follow Jesus. And I spend lots of time and care and energy and attention there along the way. But that's not really how we spend a lot of our week and a lot of our time and care and attention and energy even though Jesus is saying we can do that. It is possible to order our lives in such a way that our first priority and the most important thing is the glory of God, knowing God, being known by God, following Jesus. It's transforming. It's unbelievable what can happen to us. And we spend all this time, energy, care, attention, doing other things. And in the end, we find we are not actually serving God as master. We have other masters. And it can be money and it can be pleasure and it can be reputation and it can just be ourselves. Who's your master? Well, we ought to worry about that a little bit. But Jesus says, therefore, don't worry. What do you mean? Don't worry. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, what about your body, what you will wear. And that's fine and dandy for a lot of you because you didn't inherit the worry gene. Being somebody who carries the worry gene, let me tell you, our life is a little bit different. My mom was convinced that I would not get home safely unless she worried about my getting home. It did not matter when I went away to college 900 miles away. By that, I don't mean that every night she worried an appropriate amount that I would get home safely. But if she knew what I was doing, then she could worry appropriately for the situation. And wonder of wonders, I should say this about my mother. Serious carrier of the worry gene passed it on to me. In 1987, my sister and I and two friends went off to Europe for five and a half weeks on our own, taking trains all over Europe. We did not have cell phones. There, we didn't even have very many places booked where we knew we were staying. Like one place in England, or two places in England, uh, one place in France, one place uh, somewhere else. And we were just traveling. 
And my mom, the worrier, survived this. And she deserves credit for that. But let me let you in a little secret. If you're a worrier and you know absolutely I have no idea what's going on, then you take your worry down to a relatively low but constant level, just kind of concerned all the time. But then when you know your kid's supposed to call and check in, then the worry ramps up. And until that phone call is made, you're super anxious. Did they get to a phone? What city are they in? What are they doing now? And then you call and you talk for an hour in a pay phone using your calling card. And all of these things make no sense to some of the people in the room. <laughs> what's a calling card? What's a pay phone? Um, sorry, not all the gray hair came from worrying. Some of it came from actual age. So she was able to manage five and a half weeks of two kids being overseas without knowing day to day what they were doing. But it is a difficult thing to carry the worry gene. We are pretty much convinced that if we worry about it, it's the only way to make sure it all goes okay, even though we know it doesn't work that way. Worry, worry about work, for instance, worrying about things you have to do. Worry rarely lets you do the work that would make you feel better if you were not worrying about it, if you got the work done. But if you're worrying, it usually keeps you from working. And anyone who knows me well has seen this happen. Deb Sillo now knows what that looks like in the study. Uh, when I'm particularly worried about something, I'm unbelievably unproductive. When I'm very busy but less worried, I can get a ton of stuff done. Worry rarely lets you work, but the work would help you to feel better. But that's the problem with worry. We either work ourselves up into a frenzy that is not healthy and doesn't accomplish anything, or this is the other major problem with being a worrier. The reason you got to get that gene taken care of, you got to cut that out of your life, is because the other thing about worry is it starts to show people, I think it's all about me. If I worry about it, then I can control it. If I worry about it, then I'm worried about what I'm going to do and how it's going to reflect on me. And whatever work I'm trying to do to the glory of God becomes really about me and my being worried enough that we get it all done. Not productive, doesn't let you do work, brings you an early death. Let me not recommend the worrying thing. In the end, Jesus says, don't worry about food, drink, clothes, your basic things. Why should we not worry about them? If I don't worry about them, how am I going to get them? Worrying about them is not going to help. But here is the thing. Also not my words, but I loved it. I wrote it down. Solution to worry, maybe. The promise that we need to hang on to is this. God will take care of the life that he's given us. God will take care of the life that he's giving us, meaning we will have food, we will have something to drink, we will have clothes, we will have what we require. It is difficult to be an American in 2014 and settle for that, what we need, but we will have what we need. And the question is, will we trust that God will take care of this life that he has given us? And for parents and grandparents and great-grandparents in the room, that is not only your own personal individual life. It is not only the question of, will God take care of this life that he's given me so that I don't have to worry and fret all the time. It is also, will God take care of the life that he has entrusted to you for a certain amount of time? And that can be a hard thing. And we're going to baptize a little baby in a little bit who had his first fever this week. Do you remember the first fever? Do you remember how horrible the first fever that a child gets, an infant child gets? A, how can they run such a high fever when nothing was wrong a few hours ago? And how long can this fever go on? Long time with this baby, actually. First fever. And we worry and we fret. And we are called to remember that God will take care of this life that he's given us. Baptism can be a very dramatic thing if we think through the implications, because one of the things that we do is that we are able in, in baptism to say, yes, my child, but more importantly, God's child and whatever plans God has in store for this child. I am willing to put my child in this position where this child must submit to God's plan for his life. God is claiming this child as his own. It's also dramatic because it's an outpouring of God's love. I have known this child since before the world was put together, known Brandon's name before the world existed, known your name since before the world was put in place. And I love you so much that I have claimed you as my own and I will do whatever it takes that you might be mine. But worrying about it is not usually going to help. The birds, Jesus says, look at the birds. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store up in barns, and God feeds them. But birds are actually an interesting example because birds are not sitting on a branch just waiting for something to fall into their mouths. Birds are spending a lot of time and energy working to get the food that God is providing. So those of you who are trying to work it all out, working is good. 
If you're working, you're worrying less. But in the end, where is it coming from? No matter how hard you work, no matter how much you do, in the end, God's the one who provides. And Jesus said, birds are creatures that God has made. And he says, you are creatures made in God's image. God created you in God's own image. Will he not much more care for you? Never will I leave you or forsake you. Never will I give you more to handle than you can bear with my help. One of the great things about God's grace is that God is willing for us to fall on our faces if we try to handle these huge burdens without God's help, not because he likes to see us fall, but because it will make us think, okay, what's going wrong here? What's going wrong here is that God said, I'm happy to help you with this. Are you ready for me to help yet? And if you're a pull yourself up by your bootstraps, I did this all on myself type of person, then I can assure you at some point along the way, you will fall. And that's the time to realize I need God's help here. It's not up to you. It's not about you. It's not about us. The way that Calvin put it again, 500 years ago, but very insightful. Those who take credit for their own prosperity, those who think it's all about me, my hard work, my skills, my gifts, my talents. Those who take credit for their own prosperity do not hesitate to lose sight of God when they enter into any enter into any undertaking, whatever it is that we try to do. If we are it's all about what I have done and what I have accomplished, it's all about me, then we cannot possibly keep sight of God at the same time. And we cannot serve two masters and we will find ourselves serving ourselves. Food, drink, clothes, all of that. Jesus says the pagans are running after all those things all the time. Why? Because they're either afraid there's no God who's going to provide them for them, or there's a God who's not very nice, a God who's busy, a God who's asleep, a God who's mean and doesn't really want you to have things. And so this desperate hustle, bustle, frantic racing about about the things that the things that you most require for life, food, drink, shelter, clothing, We do not have a God who's asleep or who is busy or is mean. We have a living, loving, caring, attentive God who knows that you need these things. As one writer put it, the hand of God is filled with a hidden abundance of good things. Just waiting for us to ask, waiting for us to acknowledge. It's not about me, not about what I can do, but it's about being a child of God, letting God worry about the food and the drink and the clothing and whatever else it may be. Because in America in 2014... Fewer of us than before are worried about food or drink. This is, by the way, a very difficult passage to preach right before lunchtime. Don't worry about food or drink. And you're thinking, wait a minute, where are we going to lunch today? That's not fair. And it may not be food or drink or clothing that you're worried about. It may be something much bigger and much badder and something much more difficult to handle that is weighing you down. And it comes down to the same thing. Are we going to worry and fret and spin our wheels and not really get anywhere? Are we going to acknowledge that there is a God who has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you always to the end of the age. And I can carry that burden for you. Whatever it is you're worried about. However frightening, however stressful, however anxiety producing, God is at work. And no matter how big or how bad that thing, God is bigger, God is stronger. God is loving. He has all the power in the universe so he can help. And he is all love, so he wants to help. Whatever you're worried about, what are you worried about? Whatever causes you concern, God can do that and a lot more. God can provide all you need and a lot more. He's proven that in Jesus Christ. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, in Christ, we needed a Savior. That's our greatest need. We were lost. We were dead. We were alone. And you sent us a Savior in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. But in him, you sent us so much more than that. Not just forgiveness of sins, but eternal life, a resurrection life. Not just somebody to come in and snap his fingers and everything is different, but someone who comes and tells us who God is. What is the nature and character of God? A God who is all powerful and who is also all loving. And Jesus comes and tells us who we are. Creatures made in God's own image. People made to glorify God. To serve you. To worship you. He comes and tells us what things will be like that your great desire is to bring us into your presence so that there 
we may live forever in the presence of a holy God where every tear is wiped away, every burden is gone, every disappointment and injury healed.